Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to the final installment of the STS 2021 webinar series. This webinar series has run every month and featured presentations and panel discussions on a variety of topics relevant and important to CT surgeons and the world of CT surgery. The topic for this month is rapid fire patient safety rounds, a new paradigm for safety discourse. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available as an on-demand session as part of the 2022 STS annual meeting being held in Miami next month. At this time, I'm pleased to welcome our moderators for this session, Dr. Susan Moffitt-Bruce and Dr. Garrett Walsh. Dr. Moffitt-Bruce, welcome, and let me turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much and welcome everybody. Uh, very pleased that everybody could join us this evening and welcome to the Rapid Fire Patient Safety Rounds, a new paradigm for safety discourse. We hope this evening that this will be a rapid fire interactive session that truly highlights the quality improvement patient safety quips rounds that engage the, you, the audience, with the STS workforce on patient safety. We hope that this will advance patient safety discourse. Quips is a new framework and it introduces patient safety issues so that we can look at system-based approaches to improve and engage multidisciplinary teams in patient safety solutions. Quips can be led by residents and engages many different professions. It can be facilitated by staff and other experts in culturally safe environments. These are hypothetical scenarios that we are presenting to you today, and I hope that you will all engage in this rapid fire patient safety rounds. With that, I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to uh, Dr. Shadrawi. Thank you, Dr. Moffat Bruce. This rapid fire patient safety rounds will highlight how quips can work with both residents and staff engagement. Two clinical scenarios will be presented and three phases of care, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative will be the focus of patient safety issues that occur in the two clinical scenarios. The clinical scenarios will cover the whole spectrum of cardiothoracic surgery, so it'll be applicable to all who attend, regardless of the clinical focus. The audience can ask through the question and answer tab, what system issues they identify and the SDS workforce experts will facilitate the conversation. Ground rules, including setting expectations of cultural safety, shared ownership of mistakes, and celebrating good judgment and improvements will be shared during the briefing. Please note, the actual CRIPS rating system is in the chat box and can be downloaded so you can identify the pre, intra, and post-operative issues during the presentation. At the end of this rapid fire patient safety round session, the audience will be able to first gain an understanding of a new paradigm in patient safety rounds. Second, understand the different phases of care and potential system improvements that are possible in each. And also be comfortable to adopt the CRIPS framework in their own clinical setting and involve multidisciplinary teams in patient safety improvement. Before starting the scenarios, let's introduce the CRIPS ground rules. One, there is no hierarchy and rank is left outside the room. Two, all voices of all team members can and should be heard. Three, Everyone owns their mistakes and should feel safe to discuss them openly. Four, discussion should focus on improving team performance. Five, improvements in patient-centric care and good judgment should be celebrated. The two scenarios will be introduced after the introduction by Dr. Beer. Then the facilitator will walk through the three phases of care in a progressive way as the cases unfold. The potential system-based patient safety issues for each phase will be identified and discussed before moving on to the next phase of care. The phases and failure modes are as follows and will serve as the framework. Now I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Beer. Thank you, Dr. Shadari. My name is Joel Beer. I'm a fourth year cardiac surgery resident at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And today I'm going to outline for you the QUIPS framework. I have no disclosures. The delivery of cardiothoracic healthcare is complicated. It involves many multidisciplinary teams functioning within a complex healthcare environment. Unfortunately, adverse patient events do occur. And when they happen, we need to critically evaluate these events as to identify areas of systems improvements. Traditionally, M&M rounds have been used in this capacity 
It, but unfortunately, the procedures of these rounds vary between institutions and heterogeneous practices translate into inconsistent assessment of adverse events and inconsistent quality improvement. To this end, we developed the Quality Improvement and Patient Safety, or QUIPS program, and really it combines aspects from leading quality improvement theory from the Ottawa m and model, the Donna Bedian model, which focuses on structure, process, and outcome, as well as phase of care analysis, which has been championed by a number of leaders in cardiothoracic surgery quality, such as the Northern New England uh, Cardiovascular Group, the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons, and the Australian and New Zealand Audit of Surgical Mortality. QUIPS rounds is led by residents. Residents are the ones who prepare the cases and present them to the group. Cases can be mortalities or near misses. There's always a cardiothoracic consultant moderator, and the rounds include key stakeholders, such as surgeons, anesthesia, critical care, cardiology, clinical perfusion, and nursing. This is the QUIPS form that we use at our institution, and I will now highlight the important aspects. Starting on the left-hand side, you see that each case involves identification of patient demographics, age, gender, procedure, and the STS risk score. Below that are the three phases of care. And remember, the phases of care are the foundation of the QUIPS framework. This is where the resident identifies key events in each phase that leads to the patient's outcome. Below that, we have discussion points and inflection points. An inflection point is a point in time when a patient uh, clinically deteriorates and has a change in trajectory. A discussion point is highlighted on the right-hand side of the screen, and you can see there by the phases of care, pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. And these are points where there might be quality improvement uh, by the group. An example of a pre-operative discussion point is an incorrect operative diagnosis. An intraoperative discussion point is a perfusion cardiopulmonary bypass complication. And a post-operative discussion point is a fatal complication, such as tamponade. The case review is concise, usually less than 10 minutes, and it really focuses on the three phases of care by the resident. The multidisciplinary team participates in discussion on the discussion points and flexion points and flags any immediate action items. Why is CRIPS important? In 2012, the Michigan Group published their analysis on the phase of care mortality, as seen in Figure 2. And these authors concluded that utilizing phase of care mortality analysis stimulates surgeons and hospitals to develop and refine mortality reviews and provides a structured platform for discussion, education, quality improvement, and enhanced outcomes. In a similar fashion, the New Zealand and Australian group published their findings with the three phases of care as found in figure three. And you'll see that even beyond the phases of care, they identify key clinical management issues uh, which can stem uh, quality improvement initiatives. And these authors conclude that these findings can inform various stakeholders to improve the quality and safety of surgical care. So overall, QUIPS develops critical review skills and accountability by residents early in training. It facilitates awareness by the entire team. And again, the entire team being present is critically important to having a robust review. Data collection on each case is granular. You'll remember there's demographic information, discussion points, which are coded, as well as inflection points. And over time, your, your group can identify key areas of improvement and launch quality improvement initiatives. We'll now move on to the scenarios. And remember, these are presented by residents, moderated by a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon. And we really would like your input on your opinions on the discussion points and improvement initiatives. I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Felix. Thank you, Dr. Beer. My name is Felix Arellaro, and I'm a third year general surgery resident at St. Joseph Mercy and I will be in Michigan. Mr. A, our first case, presents his family uh, doctor with a new call. He has been a long-term smoker and has never been hospitalized. Due to his new call, his doctor sends him for a chest x-ray, which reveals a right upper lobe nodule. The report is sent back to the doctor, but Mr. A does not return to see his family doctor as his cough has resolved. The family doctor does call the patient to follow up, but is unable to connect with Mr. A. Nine months later, Mr. A presents to the emergency department with hemoptysis. The patient has lost about 20 kilograms and is short of breath with exertion. A CT of the chest is performed and a large right upper lobe lesion is noted with mid-standard lymphadenopathy. The patient undergoes PET scan, 
but the PFTs, which were arranged at a local hospital, were not completed. The PET scan is reviewed and made a standard adenopathy is noted. The patient proceeds to the operating room for lobectomy and made a standard adenopathy. The multidisciplinary thoracic clinic scheduled for the week prior to the surgery was canceled, so Mr. A's case is not re reviewed. In the operating room, the right upper lobe lesion is bulky and the mediastinum is complicated by bulky nodes in keeping with granulomatous diseases. During the course of the resection, the pulmonary artery is entered and control is not possible. A salvage pneumonectomy is necessary, followed by a mediastinal lymph node dissection. Postoperatively, the patient recovers, but is oxygen de dependent and has a T2, N2, and uncertain metastatic disease. The patient is now referred for adjuvant chemo and radiotherapy. On baseline scanning, the patient is found to have another nodule on the left. The patient, after completing the adjuvant therapy, is lost to follow up and presents with a large left lower lobe lesion and is no longer a surgical candidate. Great. Thank you very much, Felix. I think we're going to turn it over to Dr. Walsh to help moderate the discussion points and understand best how we could have uh, improved the outcome here. Well, <clears throat> well, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. Felix, you did a great job presenting a case that is hypothetical, but unfortunately <laughs> uh, it has probably occurred. And there are several discussion points that, I, that I'd like to bring up and maybe ask you what, what you think the inflection point would be. In reviewing the case that you just presented, it is truly a, a disaster. A patient within probably a year's period goes from presenting with a right upper lobe nodule to dying of metastatic lung cancer and dying without his right lung. So what, what went wrong here? So there are several system issues that I think you've described. Number one is uh, this patient was a smoker and had a chest x-ray. Is that, is that sufficient for management of a cough or is that sufficient follow-up for a gentleman who is a long-term smoker? Is the chest x-ray, even if the chest x-ray had been normal, would that have been sufficient? There are obviously system issues and this is what we as clinicians worry about all the time when we have an abnormality in a report and how do we close the loop with our radiologist and, and, and get the appropriate treatment to that patient? Nine months later, when the patient presents now with a 20 pound weight loss and a bulky mass and mediastinal lymphadenopathy, what should have happened at that time as far as workup of the mediastinal nodes and workup of this, work up of, of this mass? There'd obviously been clear progression of disease. It looks like a lung cancer, but could it have been an infection? Could it have been tuberculosis or something that can also progress and present with homoptysis? And if this patient was to be worked up, did they have an MRI of the brain for a suspicious mediastinal lymphadenopathy? Obviously, mediastinal nodes require better evaluation, either by mediastinoscopy or endoscopic bronchial ultrasound, because you do not want to find out about the mediastinal nodes intraoperatively. So there is a, a preoperative evaluation of this patient. He missed his pulmonary function test and he presented short of breath. That already is a big big warning sign. And he's lost 20 kilos in weight. That's a significant weight loss for any of us. So that's the preoperative aspect, many discussion points there. And then you have the interoperative findings of a large mass and, and a hostile mediastinum. What should the surgeon have done at that point? Was it appropriate to proceed with attempted lobectomy? They should have, what, what are the procedures that we should do as surgeons to avoid the ca catastrophic bleeding that results in a salvage pneumonectomy or even worse. So there's the interoperative details that we want to find out, but, but you never want to find yourself in that sort of situation as a surgeon. And finally, the postoperative care in this particular patient sounds like he survived remarkably having a salvage pneumonectomy, even without baseline pulmonary function tests. But before he's referred for adjuvant treatment, he's already identified a, as having a metastatic disease. Even intraoperatively, we didn't have a tissue diagnosis at the time of the pneumonectomy. As, as sad as it is that he had a pneumonectomy for lung cancer, it would have even been equally catastrophic if he had a pneumonectomy for tuberculosis. 
or small cell carcinoma of the lung, which is another thing that uh, proceeds rapidly. And finally, why did they continue with adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy with the finding of metastatic disease? So those are all kind of discussion points to get us up and talking about it, but I'd be interested in what you think one of the key inflection points in this case would be. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walsh, for uh, the excellent points. Uh, I do think that the major uh, inflection point was the delay in diagnosis and uh, other minor uh, inflection points are, you know, lack of adequate free of um, walk up of this patient and lack of multidisciplinary team approach. It, you know, um, and uh, just to uh, talk more about that, um, you know, like you rightly said, uh, this patient uh, is, is high risk, is a smoker, you know, and, you know, obvious warning signs has lost about, you know, uh, you know 20 kilograms and, you know, checks x-ray, you know, is not enough. You know, this patient, you know, should at least, you know, get a CT scan. Um, and there should be, you know, systems in place where even if the primary care doctor cannot reach this patient, you know, you know there should be uh, a dedicated, you know, in, you know, a care navigator that can also help track this patient, you know. And we need to identify system yeah, issues as to was there a problem in documenting the appropriate patient contact or are there other ways that this patient can be contacted besides just through, you know, cell phone. I mean, at our hospital now, patients uh, have an epic system on their cell phone, you know, where they can immediately see the lab results. You know, so uh, of course, the, uh, these are things that are um, open up for, com for conversation as to how we can better integrate patients also into their care, in, in, you know, such that if we cannot reach them, is there a way that they can also reach the physician if they haven't found out about their test results? And um, yeah, so uh, those are very, uh, also uh, important points in addition, in addition to what you have said. So I, I agree with you fully. That would be where I view the major inflection point in this case was the delay in diagnosis. You know, that being said, we are all struggling. Those of us with EPIC, those of us with other paper records even, it's closing the loop. And that, that is something that even large institutions, we don't necessarily do well because there are always a lot of details, a lot of things coming through the databases and how they link to the patients. But clearly that's where uh, the chance for potentially curing this patient uh, was lost. Tell me a little bit when he comes into the hospital though, uh, what, what do you think about the management when he presented to emerge with hemoptysis? What, what should have been done at that point? Um. You know, so again, you know, this patient then came to the uh, emergency room nine months later with, you know, 20 uh, kilogram weight loss and hemoptysis. Um, you know, uh, per guideline, you know, this patient should have a, uh, at this point, complete walk up, you know, for, you know, suspected lung, lung cancer because, you know, he's, uh, this patient is high risk uh, because he's a smoker. So, you know, I would say, you know, this patient should at least get, uh, you know, PET or a CT scan, this patient should get a bronchoscopy, get a PFT, uh, get a, a media standard uh, lymph node st uh, staging, you know, probably by a uh, endobronchial ultrasound. Um, also, um, it should get a, uh, and we, with a suspicious um, nodule described on the, on the PET CT scan, you know, the, uh, probably this is a state, state three lung cancer, this patient should get a, a MRI also. Susan, there's some uh, questions from the audience. Yeah, there's a lot of great comments here about the systems issues in particular around the uh, detection and, and the messaging to the patient around the, the uh, you know, notification. I think one thing in particular I'm wondering, um, based on the, the comments, uh, Felix or any other, other residents, what or who else should be at the table for these important discussions in these rapid fire patient safety rounds? What other providers would help us to address system issues? Um, well, I believe that uh, our um, mid-level providers uh, should also be at the table because they are very in, uh, integral and very important, you know, in 
in a uh, holistic uh, healthcare team. Uh, you know, uh, for example, in, in our hospital, you know, they're dead, very dedicated to, you know, spending more time with the patient and helping really follow up, you know, because, you know, one of the problems uh, in this case is the loss of follow up. So I think uh, that's the, um, the other key part of the, of the care team. I think Dr. Walsh, I think uh, Dr. Breer has a point as well. Yeah, I think, uh, or I guess I have a, a question for the group. You know, I think one of the things in this uh, case that really stood out to me is that the patient proceeded to operation uh, without the right investigations. Um, are there policies in place, uh, perhaps a tumor board or an oncology group that would review all patients and, and, des and decide the treatment pathway? Because I assume with the if you had done mediastinal staging or this patient had undergone mediastinal staging, the treatment pathway could in fact be a bit different. Yeah, so we, we certainly try to get all new patients reviewed on a multidisciplinary uh, conference. And, uh, and for, for many of those reasons, certainly patients presenting with mediastinal nodal disease, they are eligible for many neoadjuvant uh, trials. Um, so it's good to have multidisciplinary conferences and all of these. So you get the input of your oncologist and not just one oncologist, a whole group of oncologists. You get your surgical colleagues around the table, radiation oncologists, interventional pulmonologist, a uh, pathologist is there for review. So, uh, and their mid-level providers, it really needs to have a concerted kind of group effort in making a decision because there are many options for patients these days with, uh, with lung cancer, even for early stage disease that we typically would have proceeded directly to surgery previously. And uh, at, at this day and age with all of the diagnostic workups and tools available to us, this should, you should never be in the operating room with uh, struggling to deal with uh, mediastinal nodal disease unless it had been well thought out, well planned, well discussed in a multidisciplinary conference. And in fact, I was going to say that that was the second inflection point because that multidisciplinary conference allows you to go down a checklist to make sure there's nothing that you have forgotten or your team has forgotten because you always want to have everything well prepared before you get to the operation. In, at least in general thoracic surgery, about probably 80% of the thought process should, should occur before you embark on an operation. The technical aspects of the operation should be uh, no surprises, uh, carry on, and, and, uh, and then you were just dealing with some technical aspects of, you know, you encounter a tough uh, hilum, how do you manage that? How do you get proximal control of the PA to avoid that? Those are kind of technical issues, but the preoperative evaluation is so vitally important for general thoracic patients, especially those with lung cancer. Thanks, Dr. Walsh. Dr. Walsh, I see a question there about uh, including other um, providers, in, uh, in particular cardiologists and pulmonologists in the process, uh, not only for the workup, but you know, for the, uh, the care as well? Hey, well, cer certainly our, uh, you know, the, the workup would in involve pulmonologists from the general thoracic point, just like cardiologists would be involved in, in, in the work of, of a cardiac uh, primary problem. But the post-operative care is again, a multidisciplinary uh, team approach as well, especially in discussion of adjuvant care. The immediate post-operative management is, 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 at least in our institution, is almost strictly by the uh, general thoracic surgeons. Very rare that we would involve the need for intensivists. But if our patients decline and have to go to the ICU, then yes. But it's, that would be fairly rare. Thanks, Dr. Walsh. I see um, Dr. Adams has a question as well. Hi, um, you know, so one of the things that also uh, struck me about this case, um, as um, someone already alluded to, I think in the chat, at the very beginning, uh, this, when this patient presented with an abnormal finding on the chest x-ray, um, that was an opportunity that was missed. And even though uh, the patient's symptoms improved with the cough, um, I'd like to know if anyone else has any other programs in place nurse navigation, um, have worked with their radiologists in terms of uh, contacting patients, uh, whether it be an access issue um, 
a determinant of um, you know, what they're able to do to get to a patient and notify them of those findings. Anyone else that might have a system for notification, both in the chat or, uh, yes, I see lots of input here that this, this may happen in the community as well. Others that have, uh, I think Steve, you have a point? Yeah, I, you know, to that point, you know, a lot of us have developed lung nodule clinics and there's no perfect answer to this, unfortunately, but, um, the more people, the more hands on deck that you can provide with case managers and, and social workers and other people that can reach out and try to contact these patients, uh, the better opportunity you have. But I think a, a well-organized lung nodule clinic, when you see these isolated lung nodules, making sure that you get some follow-up with them, follow up with the primary care physician and so forth can be very helpful. Thanks very much. I think Dr. Walsh um, and Felix, if you want to wrap up this scenario, we'll move on to the, the next one. Well, I, I, you know, I think it's a great teaching case. It, it, it's something that we can take back to our practices. I do like the idea of how, the, uh, how this is set up that it really forces us to, to look at, you know, preoperative evaluation, the technical aspects of the interop and postoperative management issues. And they're equally important. Uh, sometimes we don't salvage patients where we can, and that's where the inflection point is. Sometimes it is a purely technical problem, but in general thoracic, it tends to be more of your preoperative evaluation. So, and I think we'll see as we discuss the cardiac case, how, how that may shift a little bit, but uh, I think this is an excellent format for discussing uh, uh, complicated cases or complications. Thanks very much. And thank you to both of you and all the participants on that first case. I think um, we will now, Joel, if you want to advance the slide, we'll move it um, to Kristen, who will present, and uh, Steve, who will moderate the next case. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Errico. I'm the fourth year cardiothoracic surgery resident at UT San Antonio. Um, for my case, Mr. X is a 60-year-old patient who was referred to the cardiologist with shortness of breath. He was told as a young adult that he had mitral valve prolapse, but for various reasons, he was not followed. He is referred to a cardiologist and an echo is performed that reveals moderate mitral regurgitation and moderate aortic insufficiency with a bicuspid valve. He is treated medically and referred to a cardiac surgeon, but does not follow up for further evaluation. He is a smoker with a 50 pack year history. Five years later, Mr. X presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath at rest hypoxia requiring four liters of oxygen and bilateral pedal edema. His chest X-ray reveals pulmonary edema and his echo reveals so, uh, severe aortic as well as mitral regurgitation uh, with an ejection fraction of 30% and his ascending aorta is noted to be slightly enlarged. He is diagnosed with critical valvular disease. He is now referred once again to the cardiac surgeon. After cardiac cath that shows no coronary artery disease, Mr. X is taken to the operating room for an aortic valve replacement and a mitral valve annuloplasty. On echo, his ascending aorta was slightly enlarged, but his aorta is not evaluated further with CTA. Intraoperatively, after cardiopulmonary bypass was initiated, but before cross clamping, the surgeon notes foaming in the arterial cannula and intraoperative TEE demonstrates air bubbles in the ascending aorta. It is discovered that the aortic root vent line has been inserted in a reverse fashion. The air embolism is managed with deep Trendelenburg, systemic cooling, and de-airing via retrograde cerebral perfusion. After de-airing, the originally planned case is resumed with aortic valve replacement using a 27 millimeter bioprosthetic valve and a mitral annuloplasty. Echo upon weaning from pump reveals a well-seated aortic bioprosthetic with no paravalvular leak and moderate mitral regurgitation with an ejection fraction of 10%. The patient becomes hemodynamically unstable and despite inotropes requires resumption of car cardiopulmonary bypass. Ultimately, the decision is made to place the patient on ECMO from which he is weaned and decannulated seven days later. Postoperative echo shows re residual moderate MR and a recovery of the ejection fraction to 40%. Postoperatively, the patient after prolonged pump run is unable to be weaned from the ventilator 
tracheostomy is required and the patient remained oxygen dependent. Turn it over to you then, Steve, to help moderate this and uh, look forward right. to the input from everybody around this very complex case. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, so where would you place the major discussion points in this case? With well, pre-op discussion, inter-op and post-op discussion points. And then we'll talk about where the inflection points might be. Well, Dr. Harrington, for me, um, there was a multitude of issues, but if I had to say the main preoperative uh, discussion point, it would be the late patient presentation. Um, the main intraoperative discussion point would be the pump complication, including the air embolism. And then postoperatively, I think the heart failure that we saw um, was related to inadequate myocardial protection. Okay, those are three good ones. What would you? What about preoperatively the lack of um, uh, doing any kind of workup with a CTA? He didn't get a transesophageal echo. And here's a gentleman who presented in really acute heart failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, sounds like they really didn't bother to get him out of that. Should we include those as well in those discussion points later on? Yes, I definitely agree. I think okay. that the outcome could have been different if there had been more optimization of the patient preoperatively. So we've got several things to look at here. Um, if we line up the Swiss cheese, where, what was the key piece of, of Swiss cheese where the whole lined up to let all these problems happen and, and really come to a, a, a head for us? In which phase of care did things just crash on us here? For me, I would think it has to be the moment that the air embolism happened. And uh, what kind of things could we have done to prevent that? Well, one thing that I know we do at my institution is always check that the root vent is indeed suctioning before we connect that to the, um, to the patient. Um, also, uh, as I learned in discussion with this committee, there's typically a one-way valve in the pump that would help prevent things like this from happening. So in general, ensuring that and knowing the status of uh, that feature on your pump could be something for, for us to do. Uh, Dr. Fendel, are you on, can uh, you unmute yourself there? I think, you know, you, you related a story to us uh, just about that process and how uh, putting that one-way valve came in. Uh, would you like to talk about that for us a little bit? Sure. Can you hear me? Oh, oh good. Yep. Yes, I, I had the unfortunate experience about 25 years ago of having a, a somewhat different type of case, but in fact, the aortic root vent uh, became pressurized because of a, rever a reversal of the tube and the roller pump down at the, at the pump uh, station. And this actually happened, believe it or not, with the, the aorta cross clamped. And I learned that air can actually go a, across a clamped aorta. But as a, the accident occurred because of this, um, the pressurization of the vent line. And as a result of that, we really changed perfusion standards around the world where pretty well most centers now use that one way valve. So that's an excellent way to, to check this. It is a bit of a hazard without a one way valve because something like this could happen. Thank you. Um, Steve, Steve, I'm wondering if uh, yeah. I might just ask uh, whilst you're uh, thinking about it, I'm wondering if uh, uh, Joel or Eddie can comment on some of the, uh, the QUIPS uh, template and how it might aid in uh, some of the conversation. Sure, I can, uh, I can take that one and maybe Dr. Shajari can add on to my explanation. So if you look at the intra-op phase there, um, we have a perfusion, a cardiopulmonary bypass uh, complication, which I definitely do think uh, this was. And also you have a, a 212, which is an equipment failure. Um, so I guess taking into consider consideration Dr. Feindel's uh, explanation, we would tick off uh, both of these and uh, discuss either immediate action items. So for example, um, if our institution was not using uh, the one-way valve, that would be an immediate action item to be implemented. Uh, otherwise we would uh, keep it for a, a large data analysis of the whole set to see if there's common trends or repeat accidents. 
Joel, while I've got you there, I'm gonna ask you, do you see anything else in the intraoperative phase that would, uh, you'd like to talk about here that might be in a really strong inflection point or a tipping point in addition to that air embolism? Yeah, I, I think the air embolism uh, before the aorta was cross-clamped was where things uh, uh, start to went sour for the patient. Um, you know, the, the usual uh, care we described, you know, there needs to be a deep trend Bellenberg. You need to de-air the, the, the cardiac pulmonary bypass circuit. And in this case, the root vent, you need to cool to hypothermia. And then uh, the team here opted to use retrograde cerebral perfusion. I think perhaps somewhere along the way, um, while they were managing the massive air embolism, um, you know, they, they use anti-grade cardioplegia in the setting of a severe AI, um, which is probably not optimal. Um, so I think that in a, an adequate myocardial protection was a, a key uh, a key problem in this case, probably because the team was focused on managing the air embolism. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because. Uh, in times of crisis and times of stress. And we've learned a lot about this from, from other industry, particularly the airplane industry, the aircraft industry, as we study why good pilots crash airplanes and, and, the time, and why they make such you know, critical mistakes. And it's, it's really about what happens to us in our, in our brains in times of crisis. And studies have shown that we tend to revert back to very emotional thinking at that time. And we, we tend to get our minds very focused on, on, and lose some of our real cognitive abilities to, to do broad thinking at that time. And we focus on things that are instinctual. You know, that's where we get to and we're, when we get in these highly emotional and charged episodes is we rely back on instinct. And the first instinct here was probably to, we gotta get this air out. And the completely lost sight of the fact that we need to protect this heart and the myocardial. And then that in turn led to myocardial injury and the need for ECMO to get off bypass. So I think you know, here's another aspect of being able to recognize these things that happen, recognize them as part of our, our system as, as humans, we have failures. And then we have to learn how to re rely on that whole operative team to be able to provide call outs and, uh, and someone to call up and say, hey, listen, we, we, we're not given any myocardial protection here. What about some cardioplegia? And, and, and get everybody thinking and everybody on the, on the same page and getting everybody to learn to do that is, is really important. So I would agree that we really, th those are the two key inflection points that get this case started. Uh, you want, uh, Kristen, I'm gonna turn, go back to you a little bit and I'd like others to check and uh, chime in as well about the importance of some of this preoperative workup that didn't seem to happen here. Yes, um, I think that there was certainly some missing investigation in the preoperative period, uh, namely evaluation of the ascending aorta, especially in the setting of, of a bicuspid valve. Um, in this particular patient, I'm not sure that that would have changed the ultimate outcome relating to the air embolism and, um, and the heart failure that we saw postoperatively, but it could have. So I think that to optimize and ensure the best outcome for our patient, that would have been a critical part of the pre-op workup. I see a hand up there, Sue. Yeah, Steve, I think there's a couple. I think Dr. Shadraudry has uh, something to add, and then uh, Dr. Adams uh, after that. Um, and then uh, actually, uh, Dr. Or, uh, Manisha also has a comment. So uh, Eddie, then Kamari, and then Manisha, please. Thank you, Susan. I just want to add to what Dr. Beer and Dr. Harrington were mentioning. You brought up the Swiss cheese model and with multiple layers where something could fall through, that is evident and that really is the issue here. The beauty of the quips format is we can actually put in code in a very structured format where the errors or the mishaps may have happened and eliminate them one by one at the system level. So if the issue is a preoperative intervention or notification that should have been done, we can identify it and code it. If there are intraoperative issues that have happened, again, we can identify them in an organized way and ideally work on improving them. So I believe by following this format, we can identify in each phase of care where a mishap may have happened, but more importantly, code it and learn from it at the next level and the next phase of care. So it's great to see the discussion move in that direction. And ideally we wanna to work to improve it at the system level. And the purpose here, as I'm hearing great conversation from Kristen and Felix, especially, we all feel safe to bring up these issues and talk about them and ideally have a plan moving forward. 
So thank you very much for bringing that up. And I think I'll pass it on to Monisha next. Uh, Kamara, I think Kamara, you're next and then sure. Monisha. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you, Susan. So, um, you know, one thing that uh, Steve, I think was alluding to also just in the pre-op uh, evaluation of this patient, um, maybe they would have benefited from a multidisciplinary discussion as well um, in terms of managing and optimizing his heart failure uh, prior to, to surgery, which also kind of leads me to another question. And Joel, maybe you can answer this, but do you guys ever discuss patients that don't go to surgery? Uh, maybe they are presented and or there was a delay in uh, diagnosis or a missed opportunity. Uh, do those patients get presented as there um, was a failure in the system? So I, I think that would be a, a great patient uh, population to include. Uh, at our institution, we're currently uh, just reviewing mortalities, but I definitely think there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from the case you pointed out. Anisha next, and then Dr. Walsh, if that's okay, Steve and uh, Krista. Yeah, so I just wanted to point out that both cases uh, had a clear failure of clinical knowledge on part of the MD. I think the way um, these rounds are coded could also provide the physician with some feedback as well with consistent themes if, you know, the um, each case is having the same issue whether it's pre-op or intra-op. So that would be useful as well. Go ahead, Garrett. Garrett? Yeah, so Steve, you brought up the airline industry. You know, one of the things that we know that uh, we've learned from the airline industry and have applied a little bit in our timeout process is the use of checklists. But we don't typically have a uh, necessarily a written checklist that we've checked all the points before we get into the operating room. And we don't necessarily pull up a checklist when we're having trouble in the operating room, such as an air embolism or a PA injury. Uh, what do you think about, you know, the pilots, the first thing they do when they get in trouble in the air, they, they pull, out their, uh, pull out their checklists. Uh, these days, I, I understand they're on iPads and you just kind of go down the checklist what to do with air embolism, just so you, you can kind of restructure your thoughts in, in an emergency situation. Well, you, you probably sh shouldn't get me started on this because actually I am a pilot and uh, this is an you know, near and dear to my heart. I uh, you know, believe in checklists very, very strongly. And I think a lot of these things that we talked about uh, could be, uh, checklists could help fix those. They're not, they're not a cure and checklists are only as good as you make them, number one. Number two, in emergencies as pilots, there are certain things that we have committed to memory it happens so quickly that you can't rely on a checklist. So you've got to have certain things committed to memory. You get the situation under control and then you pull out your checklist. One of the things we did in my operating room is we have checklists for air embolism. We have checklists for aortic dissection. We have a checklist for a, a, a oxygenator failure. All these are laminated and put on the pump. And so when something like this happens, the perfusionist has it there and the, the assistant or the perfusionist will read out things to us at the appropriate time to make sure the rest of us are doing things because I can't have the checklist up at the operating room, but the perfusionist or the anesthesiologist can. So, so those are some of the things that, that we did in my operating room to standardize our procedures and provide this. Another Thank question out there, Susan? Yeah, I see a couple of questions. Um, and I wonder if uh, Walter wants to weigh in because he has some great questions. And then we have a question from the audience about cameras in the OR. Walter, do you want to ask your question about who has the last word? Just have Please. trouble getting. Go ahead, Walter. No worries. Um, how about uh, Joel? Can you give us? Uh, I know you put an answer in the chat, but really give us a sense of kind of the culture within these uh, rapid fire uh, patient safety rounds, and then we'll turn it over to. Um, um, I maybe yes, uh, Steve. You can answer about the uh, cameras in the OR. I'll answer about the cameras and then I'll, I'll just take a couple seconds to do a wrap up on this one then. That's great. All right, Joel, can you give us a sense? Yep. Um, so how our presentations work is uh, the resident is the case and they also identify what they think the discussion points are and they will present that to the multidisciplinary group, at which point there is a discussion and confirmation of 
you know, which are, which are confirmed. And then the moderator will record uh, those values on the final CRIPS form. If there is some uh, disagreement, um, the moderator will do their best to try and find a consensus and that will go on the final CRIPS form. So the resident starts uh, the decision-making and the moderator confirms and finalizes the discussion and inflection points. Um, Thank you, Joe. I'm wonder wondering, Steve, just before you go, um into, um, uh, or maybe you want to answer the camera question and then Eddie has a, a comment and then we'll back to you for a summary. Okay, quick thing on the camera question. Obviously this is new and controversial, but I'll tell you that we, at, uh, we're doing a research project uh, through the University of Michigan right now. And we just got IRB approval to do just that, to use, the, uh, to use cameras in the operating room. We've got agreement from the, all the staff. And of course it requires patient uh, agreement that will, there'll be cameras in there as well. Uh, to look at uh, both surgeon technical and non-technical factors in the R, and we're gonna study this and see where the benefits of this are. So it's a whole new exciting research uh, opportunity uh, that we've got a grant for and got IRB approval for. Eddie? Thank you, Susan. I just wanna to add to Dr. Beer's comment and actually answer Kumari's question. Do you develop an action plan during QUIPS? The point of putting these in coded format is to have a <coughs> library and an absolute number of how many complications and in which group they've happened, pre, inter, or post-op. And the purpose of, at the end of every presentation is to have a mini action plan for what happened during that case. At the end of the year, we compile all these action plans and that guides us as to where the system level improvements need to be. Sometimes it's in the pre-op phase, sometimes it's intra-op and we the surgeons have to deal with it. And sometimes it's post-op and involves a much bigger multidisciplinary team, including the ICU and nursing and other stakeholders. So the purpose really is to get to an action plan that we all agree upon, a true consensus of all the stakeholders, and that way we get buy-in. And it's only after we get buy-in of the whole multidisciplinary team can we move forward. And the stakeholders at each phase of care can be very different. In the pre-op phase, it definitely involves cardiology more than anyone else, as well as primary care and pulmonary. In the intraoperative phase, it's really us with anesthesia and nursing that can make the biggest impact. In the postoperative phase, it definitely involves ICU nursing, nursing on the postoperative units, OT, PT, and all the other stakeholders involved. So your question is really the ultimate goal of QUIPS, which is to find an actionable plan that the whole team buys into. At the end of the day, it's about the team dynamics and how well the team works together and this has really become a structured format for us to get that consensus and get that buy-in. So thank you for the question. And uh, I think it's been a great job you guys have done. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Maybe, uh, Steve, just before uh, you wrap up the section, we have a question from one of our colleagues, Camille, who just wants to know, um, Eddie, how do you and Joel and the team uh, at Dalhousie aggregate some of this data and then have it reported out? Joel, did you want to go ahead and answer that? Sure. Yeah, so we just take, um, it's a simple database uh, with uh, the variables I've described, the demographics, um, the discussion points are coded, and then the inflection points. And then we do do reports, um, usually on a yearly basis. I think our next one is coming up uh, in March. And uh, we've actually now reviewed uh, over 100 cases over the last three years. So that will be a milestone for our group. And I think the goal for that session, uh, once we've reviewed the data, is really find those areas where we can improve, you know, those repeat offenders, those repeat issues that we can address at a systems level uh, to improve the quality of care of our patients. Great. Thank you, Joel. I think Steve, one last hand I see there, Chris uh, Feindel has a, and then honestly, I'll hand it over to you to summarize your, uh, your session with Kristen. Chris? I just want to, maybe I'll wait till Steve summarizes, I'll hold my question. That's a question to, to add. Okay, that sounds great. Go ahead, Steve. Well, you know, just to summarize very quickly in a minute or so is that although this was a very complex case, uh, I think we can see that in a very short time, we were able to identify that, first of all, preoperatively, the patient was not evaluated properly, didn't have the proper test done, and that he was not optimized for surgery, he presented in heart failure and, and went to the operating room in heart failure. This then placed him at a much higher risk for both intra and postoperative complications. I think we correctly identified that the, the trigger event or the seminal event that lined up all these holes in uh, the Swiss cheese model was the air embolism. And that in that emergency procedures that followed, it appeared quite likely that the measures were there to provide adequate myocardial protection were, 
simply overlooked. And it's not unusual that in times of crisis, it's instinctive for us to, as I said, revert back to uh, decision-making uh, that's on an instinctual, not any cognitive basis as our cognitive functions become blunted. And then this in turn led to the myocardial injury and the need for ECMO to rescue the patient. Postoperatively, the phase was then doomed to be complicated uh, with the need for long-term ventilatory support, tracheostomy, uh, rehab for quite some time, and then quite likely never a return to full recovery for this gentleman. The important thing were that we were able to identify the action items and the, around the processes to ensure that things such as a vent line is not as oriented correctly by utilizing um, tools such as a one-way valve and checklist as part of our protocol uh, as a process improvement measure. Uh, we identified, I think, the checklists and team callouts and the importance of each of us to query each other and not be afraid to talk up and speak up when there's episodes or things that happen in the operating room or any time in the phase of care where we're not certain. We have to call out these safeties as it's, uh, the term is referred to by my heroes, the uh, Blue Angels. And then finally, not everything in this case was a, a failure. I think we, we spent a lot of time talking about the things that didn't go well, but I think we need to also recognize that the corrective measures to manage the air embolism uh, needed to be recognized and that this patient actually had no neurological injury. He had other injuries, but not a neurological injury. So there were, the corrective injuries need to be recognized and celebrated. And that's part of the CRIPS process as well. It's not always about the bad thing. It's also about recognizing the things that we do well and uh, celebrating those and, and sharing them with others. Thank you so much, Steve and Kristen. Chris? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Steve, uh, I, knowing you're an airline pilot, I think you're very much aware that the pilot checklist didn't, it came about, of course, because of a terrible accident, likely back in Tenerife in 1979, I think it was. Or, and so it's, it's, it was a long haul to move that culture and change that culture of one of less blame and working together. So I, my question really is directed towards Ed because um, it's very impressive what he's been able to achieve in Halifax. And some of us are old enough to remember, I certainly remember my days at McGill when the uh, junior staff and chief residents were eaten alive by the chief of surgery. And it was very much a shame and blame uh, culture. And to take that cu culture, which many of us remember very well, and take it into a culture where everyone shares or discusses the case and there's an open sharing of the mistakes. Ed, I, you know, I, I think it has a lot to do with leadership, but I, I'd like you just to comment because it doesn't happen that easily in a lot of centers, I'm sure. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer we're all vested in the same interest, which is to do what's best for the patient. And regardless whether you're a physician or a nurse, and whether you're a surgeon or a cardiologist or a pulmonologist, we're all there for that reason. So to institute culture change, it's all about people buying into the same vision, the common vision. And I made it clear that I want us all to do what's best for the patient. I know that sounds ridiculous, but we're all there for that. I engaged cardiology, perfusion, anesthesia, nursing. I asked them to be participants in this process. And I was shocked. Our, our first quip session, this is before COVID, was actually in person. And uh, the room wasn't big enough to hold everyone. And I was quite shocked. Almost, you know, I think 12 cardiologists showed up, which for us in our center is a big number. 12 cardiologists showed up as well as the whole cardiac surgery team. And I couldn't fit all the nurses in the room. And it just shows you they had a vested interest in doing what's best for the patients. The ICU nurses want to know what happens in the OR. And the OR nurses want to know what happened to that great save that we did in the operating room. So everyone bought in. I think true culture change comes from people buying into your vision, having the same values, and all of us going after the same mission. So when we did all that, it's, I think it's been a success overall. And even now in the Zoom format, when I look at our quips every uh, Wednesday or last Wednesday of every month when we do them, I'm shocked how many people show up. And I know some participants have five or six people around the screen because they're literally in the ICU working and they're taking their time to come watch quips. So it's become a monthly event for us. And I think really, Chris, the biggest value has been 
the engagement and how excited people are getting around it. So I think Go you ahead. want to identify the system issues that Kumari alluded to. How do we get an action plan out of this? The action plan doesn't come from me, the moderator. I actually tease it out of the crowd. And they tell me where to go next. And I'm always amazed the, the suggestions the nurses have, the cardiologists have. I think at the end of the day, it makes us all better surgeons, which is really what, what we want. That's our selfish gain of this. We become better surgeons. Ed, did you have, uh, at the beginning of this, was there a pushback from the surgeons saying, well, if we get everyone in the room or on the Zoom, um, we're not going to be open and discuss our problems that occurred, perhaps technical problems in the OR. And how did you get around that? So there was pushback. That's no secret. There was definitely pushback and uh, many nasty comments. But at the end of the day, as I said, I'm a firm believer we're all there for the vested interest, the best same interest of the patient. And as time went on, all those comments went away. There still are some, I'm not going to lie to you. There are negative comments that happened, but overall, I think we're all committed to the same purpose. And I think if you keep that positive vibe going, so to speak, I know it sounds kind of tongue in cheek, but we all eventually buy into it right? Leadership is about putting the right people on the bus and driving the bus in the right direction. So as a leader, you get to pick the direction, but I have to find all the people, put them in their seats in the bus, and we start driving. And uh, we all know where the mission is. We all know what my vision is. And the group uh, has been excellent. And we all want better outcomes, which is really what this is all about. This is really just a structured approach to m ms that is resident driven and staff facilitated. And I think that's been the value of it. And you know, I, I'd love to see more of it only because we've seen the value in it. And I'm sure you guys will do just as good a job as us, if not better. Thank you so much, Eddie. And, and thank you, Chris, for those excellent questions. I think in the last minute or so, I'm going to turn it over to Joel, who started this, just to summarize. And then I want to thank everyone, and particularly the residents this evening, for just having these uh, open conversations and sharing this new um, format for patient safety rounds. Joel, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Moffat, Bruce. Just co-tailing on Dr. Shajari's comments, you know, QUIPS is uh, presented by residents and prepared by residents and is supported by faculty. Uh, it's very important that all the team members engage in the discussions because everybody's perspective is valued and important. There is data collection on each case and it's granular. And over time, as you review more and more cases, you'll be able to identify trends and areas for QI opportunities. And overall, again, as Dr. Shajari has pointed out, it really enables a culture of transparency and continuous improvement to improve the quality of care uh, that we give to our patients. I'd just like to, again, give a very warm thank you to Dr. Moffat Bruce and the entire STS workforce uh, for hosting tonight's event. Thank you all. Over to you, STS, for closing us out. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Moffat Bruce, and thank you to all our panelists today for your participation and insight. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll enjoy a variety of discounts, benefits, and opportunities to help you grow professionally. Learn more at sts.org slash membership. The STS Cardiothoracic Surgery eBook is now available for purchase. Online or mobile, it is the most complete and authoritative resource for CT surgical information in the world. Learn more and subscribe at sts.org slash ebook. Register now to attend the STS annual meeting in January and be together again with the cardiothoracic surgery community. In person or virtual, registration is available. Go to sts.org slash annual meeting to view the program and register. Thank you and good night.